Hi. This video here has been taken from my rescue dog course. The course teaches you how to choose a rescue dog, how to prepare for them, and how to settle them into your home. This section here is choosing and preparing for your rescue dog. If you're interested in that, then please go onto my website. You can um, enroll for the rest of the course where I'll take you through the three phases of being a rescue dog. So that's the first three days, the next three weeks, and then the weeks that follow. During these phases, your dog has different needs um, and I'll show you how to meet those needs and how to avoid any additional behavior problems or trauma or anything like that that can be associated with those very important early weeks with you. I hope you enjoy it. Take care. Hi there and welcome to section one. In this section that we're going to be talking about why would you rescue a dog? There's lots of reasons why you might prefer to rescue rather than perhaps getting a new puppy. Maybe you don't want to start from scratch with your puppy's training. Perhaps you believe there's too many unwanted dogs in the world and you want to help ease that burden. The Dogs Trust estimates around 17,000 dogs go through their rescue centres every year. And that's just the Dogs Trust. There are many other rescues as well. So there are a huge number of dogs that are actually looking for homes. Perhaps you feel like maybe it's more of an ethical choice and you don't want to support puppy breeding. Or maybe this is more about the dog itself. Perhaps you would prefer to be able to see the dog you're getting. Perhaps you can better understand its needs. Maybe you can understand how big it is. You'll see um, how much energy the dog has. What's its personality like? How do you feel about the dog? Does he like you? Do you like him? This is actually quite an important part of rescue because when you take a puppy, of course, you have no idea how that puppy's gonna turn out. More and more often, puppies can be quite variable. There's a, lots of personalities in every litter. So if you get a dog that's maybe a little bit older, the personality has had time to develop. And of course, it's a bit cheaper. Um, many of the dogs that come through rescue have been neutered. Um, they've been health checked. Perhaps any treatment that they've needed has already been started. And a lot of rescues actually support ongoing treatment as well with their rescue dogs. They don't want the cost of healthcare to be a factor that comes into choosing whether you're going to rescue a dog from them. Many rescues also offer a lot of support to their adopters and this can be really invaluable because they know the dogs really, really well and they'll be able to help you settle the dog in. They'll be able to give you advice about how to look after your dog. When things go wrong, they'll be there to help you. And of course, if it doesn't work out, then they're always there to look after the dog. And sometimes things don't work out, not just because that's the way you've chosen them to, but in years to come, perhaps if you can't look after the dog, maybe you become ill yourself or something else happens, rescues will always offer that kind of backups and support. So you know your dog will always be fine. Or maybe you have your own reasons. Um, take a minute, maybe even now, just to have a think about why you're choosing to rescue as opposed to taking a different option. What does it mean to you? And, and why is this important for you? Once you've decided um, that rescuing is absolutely for you, there's very many different routes. Um, they all have their own pros and cons. This is Charlie. He's a rescue dog that I fostered for a while. He came from a home. And um, we'll talk more about different options in section two. But just because he came from a home didn't mean he had a seamless, easy route into my home, there was a huge amount of work that needed done with poor Charlie and um, I spent quite a lot of time working with him. So we'll come on to that more in the next section. Um, but hopefully this has given you a wee bit of insight into what to expect um, and why you might be thinking of rescue. I'll see you in the next section. Take care for now. Bye bye. So welcome back. We're in section two and we're going to be talking about what is the right route into rescue for you? As I said, there's many, many options. Um, a home from home rescue, just like with Charlie. He came from one home straight there um, and into my home. Some dogs come via um, a traditional bricks and mortar rescue. I talked about the rescue that I first worked in when I first started in dog behavior. Um, there are international rescue options. So many people are choosing to rescue dogs from abroad. Um, some of those are street dogs, some of those are homes. Um, and also there's options of rescues that use foster carers, which is the rescue that I had established and run for a while. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons really of all of them. So 
This is Charlie. Um, he was a home to home rescue. Um, this is probably the least stressful option, but it was still really hard on him. So um, a home to home kind of rescue has the advantage um, that it is probably the least stressful for the dog. Um, if you're looking to rescue a dog um, from a home, the places you might look, um, perhaps Gumtree, Facebook, friends and family. Um, but it's not stress free, um, as you'll see later on. Um, but you do have the advantage, you see, of being able to see the dog in the home. Um, you'll be able to see how they interact with their family. Um, you get to meet the owners. You get to meet um, the dog himself. Perhaps they'll even let you take him out for a walk. So you'll have a bit of time, really, that you can spend getting to know the dog better. Um, you'll also, um, as you spend time with him, get to feel of how he feels about you. How is he um, bonding with you? The downside, of course, to this is that the owner may not actually just tell you the full truth. So you may not really get a full picture of um, why they're trying to rehome him or what his history was like. Um, <clears throat> the risk here, of course, is whether the owner has been honest or not. And hopefully you'll be able to judge that while you spend time with them and the dog. Rescuing a dog home from home doesn't come with any support or backup either. So if it doesn't work out with you, then you won't have anybody that you can ask um, to help or support you with the dog. So there's a medium risk when you're um, adopting a dog in this kind of environment. Um, home from home is a good option. If you're able to find a dog that way, of course, you may not be able to find the kind of dog that you would like. So maybe you would prefer to go with a tr traditional uh, bricks and mortar rescue, perhaps like the dog's trust. Um, these have their own advantages. Um, this type of rescue does come with some stress on the dog. So um, moving from a home and then into a rescue, which is very often a different environment to what a dog's used to. A dog maybe that's been at home um, in a home environment will have to adjust from going from there and into something that's maybe a bit more kind of outdoors. There's not gonna be the comforts they're expecting. They'll have a kennel probably. They may not have company during the day or night. Um, so there's some stress there in that kind of, in adapting into that environment, but you will get to spend time with the dog. So this is important. Most rescues will encourage you to spend time with these dogs. They'll introduce you to different dogs. You'll be able to take them out for walks um, and things like that. So that's kind of important. You'll also get to meet the staff and you'll be able to talk to them about the dog. How did he settle in? Ask them questions. Um, they'll be able to help you understand whether you, they think the dog would suit you or not. As I've said already in the course, dogs that come through a bricks and mortar rescue are often neutered and they're health checked. So you'll be able to, um, to know if the dog has um, anything that you need to worry about, any sort of ongoing health conditions or problems. And as I mentioned before, often they support you through those anyway, um, and they'll encourage you to use their fat and they'll be able to help you, but not always. So something that's worth checking there with that kind of thing. The staff all know the dogs, so you'll be able to talk to them about the different dogs, not just the dog you're interested, they might be able to make suggestions about other dogs too. Um, and they offer um, a huge amount of aftercare and support. As you said, if anything goes wrong, they'll be there to look after you and help. Um, they will insist on home checks, which is a really good thing because they want to make sure that the dogs that they're looking after are gonna to go to good homes that are gonna look after them. They also want to make sure the homes are right for those particular dogs. So this isn't necessarily always about whether they think you could look after a dog or not, but will this home suit that particular dog? They'll know them well, so hopefully they'll be able to give you advice about the types of dogs that would suit best in the types of homes. Some rescues have quite strict rehoming policies too. Um, they've had um, dogs return to them in the past, um, dogs are handed into war all the time. So they're really wary of making sure that dogs go into the absolute best homes they can find. So sometimes that means that they exclude maybe young children or gardens that aren't properly fenced or flats and things like that. It's purely on past experience that often those types of homes don't work out well for all kinds of dogs. So it's worth talking to them about your home if you have any concerns about any sort of strict policies. Um, the, the thing to remember, of course, when we go through the course is that you'll learn about how they settle into a new home and actually 
it'll become a bit clearer why those policies are quite important because the first three days the dog has different needs to what they might have going forward into the following weeks and the following months. It's very hard when you, um, if you don't have a garden that's secure or if you've got very young children to create the kind of environment that a dog needs to settle into as well. So they're just being extra cautious and it's a good thing that they want to be very, very sure that the homes are going to be right for their dogs. One of the downsides is that the dogs are not assessed in homes in um, bricks and mortar rescues. They only get to see the dog while they're in this um, rescue environment. So they'll be able to see how they cope being in a kennel environment, how they cope meeting dogs and things like that on a daily basis, but they won't be able to tell you what they're like um, in terms of being in a home, listening to TVs and things like that. For that, you maybe have to rely a little bit on the history that's come with the dog when they've brought the dog into the sanctuary. This is a relatively low risk option for you, of course. So if you're new to um, rescue dogs and you've not rescued before, going through a place like this is probably gonna be the best option for you just because they've spent so much time with the dogs and they know the dogs and also they offer so much support and backup. Um, the other types of rescues are the foster-based rescues. So this is the one that I ran. Um, and this is a sort of a, a good mix of a home from home and a traditional rescue. There's a little stress on the dog and it depends really on the dog and how they've come through the rescue process, what um, led to them needing a new home, how have they ended up into a rescue. So because they've gone into a home, um, they've not had to adjust to that new kind of environment. Um, and they'll go straight from that home into yours. You'll get to spend time with the dog and you'll get to spend time with them in a home. Um, the fosterer will be able to talk to you about the dog too. They will have lived with the dog, so they'll be able to tell you how they adapted to being in a home and how they've settled down. And they'll be able to give you some suggestions and advice moving forward that might well suit this particular dog. Um, in a foster care situation as well, the advantage, of course, is that it's very one on one. So the foster carer will have spent an awful lot of time with this dog, as opposed to the bricks and mortar rescue, where one person may be working with lots and lots of different dogs. Just like a bricks and mortar rescue, these dogs are often health checked and they're neutered as well. So that's another thing that you don't need to worry about. The foster, as I said, knows the dogs really, really well um, just because they're living with them. You know, it's um, hard to not get to know a dog in that time. Um, you'll get plenty of aftercare and support from the network as well. So if anything does go wrong, people will want to help you and look after that dog and, and give you the best advice um, that they possibly can. Again, just like a bricks and mortar rescue, this type of rescue will normally insist on home checks just for the same reasons as before. They really just wanna make sure that your home is gonna suit this particular dog. So this is quite a low risk option for you again, if you're thinking of rescuing for your first time, this could be a good option for you. Um, international rescue, um, this is probably the maximum amount of stress that the dog can have. There are lots of issues with international rescue for the dog. So the first one of course is that they will be taken from wherever they are, if they live on the streets or often they've just been found as strays. Um, and they'll be taken into sort of a kennel environment. Sometimes they go into little impounds and they'll be mixing with lots of other dogs. So that's one big um, change for them. Then they'll wait there. Um, sometimes the people that are caring for them, especially in the initial um, place that they arrive at, are not always very friendly and welcoming. So that can be quite stressful. And then sometimes they'll be rescued by the organisation that are helping you and will... will um, match you to your dog. So they'll take them away. Um, the very first place they arrive at often, they don't keep dogs very long. So the rescue's job there is to, to get them out of that pound and get them into a safe place. Um, they don't have an awful lot of money. So a lot of these places are not great, but um, it is a stopgap between um, living on the streets and then of course coming to the UK. So the next step there of course, is that they could be there for a while and then they'll be brought by a van usually um, on a long journey from wherever it is they've come from, whether that's Spain or Romania or wherever. And they'll travel on that bus and that van all the way to the UK. And often then they're just handed to 
the adopter, so to you, and that could be whenever the, the van arrives. So you'll be given a time and a place to meet the van. You'll go there and they'll, they'll just hand you your dog and then they'll be away. So the, the man that's in charge of driving the dog, he probably won't know the dogs very well and he's certainly not um, a part of the rescue. He's, he's paid for by the rescue, so he won't know very much. Um, so just that transition on its own um, is really quite stressful for the dog. Of course, with this kind of option, um, the dog is usually in a foreign country at the time that you, you, you choose them. So you, you'll have maybe a small video or some photos to go to. So you're not going to have an opportunity to actually meet the dog and you're not going to be able to spend time with the dog. Um, all you have to go on is just that small amount of information and the information, of course, that the rescue write down for you. So with these types of dogs, um, there's a lot of loud language barriers, there's multiple handlers, often the records are not kept very well, and any history that they do have of the dog is often missing or not correct. So that can make things quite tricky for a person when you're thinking about adopting a dog, that the information even that you're being told about the dog um, might not necessarily be accurate either. Um, this dog may never have been in a home or a family. They're taken from the streets and they're brought to pounds. So it could be um, a very feral dog. It could be a dog that's lived on the streets for a long time. Um, it may have been a dog that was a house pet, you know, and has escaped or whatever and ended up on the streets. So there's a big risk about which kind of dog you might actually end up getting. Um, the dogs are sometimes neutered, but not often. Um, and they may have had a health check, but in experience, that's probably worth something doing quite early on just to make sure, um, make sure the vaccination records are correct um, and make sure the dog is in good health, check the age, all those kinds of things. So that's something I would suggest you do yourself. Um, I wouldn't necessarily trust the information that you do get from those places. Um, the staff, of course, don't know the dogs. So often the person you're liaising with in the UK it's not the person that spent any time with the dog. So you really have such a limited amount of information to go on when you're making a decision about having this dog in your home. As I said, it could be a feral dog. And that's a dog that has never lived in a home, was never a pet. So that's a dog that's been born to another dog that lived on the streets. So that's all that dog would know. Or maybe they've been a house pet. You just won't know until they've arrived. Um, this is an expensive option as well because not only will you be paying an adoption fee, but you'll also be paying for all of the transport fees um, and any kind of um, documentation, passports and things like that that are required to get your dog from wherever they are um, to your home. So a lot of that expense comes down to you. So this is a really high risk option to you. Um, in many cases, I've heard of people that haven't even got a dog that they feel is even the same dog that they chose Dogs have come, they've had no social skills. Um, some dogs have come and they've been amazing pets. Um, it's just such a high risk um, option. And if you're not experienced with rescue dogs, this is the kind of option I would usually avoid um, just because you could end up with any kind of dog with any amount of training or socialization. So that is all gonna come down to you if you end up with a dog that is um, not a house pet originally. We have the council pound. Um, this is an option. It's um, reasonably high stress on the dog. Um, the council pound are often quite desperate to find homes and quickly as well. They can't keep dogs there forever. That's a council service that they're providing. So they will not have quite so much um, uh, in the way of home checking or things like that. Um, you'll not have much option to spend time with the dog. So you won't be able to take the dog out for a walk or miss or, or meet them or play with them or anything like that. Your impression of the dog will be entirely from what you can see from inside their kennel. You'll be able to see them from the outside of the kennel. Um, again, with council pound dogs, uh, the history is often missing or even if there is a history, it's not correct. Um, people will um, give dogs to the council for all kinds of reasons. So the dog you see is the dog um, that you're getting. So that's something to be aware of um, with a council dog. They won't do any health checks. Of course, they will do um, health care if the dog is obviously sick or, or needs something, but they won't do routine kind of health or things like that. And the staff don't really get to spend 
time with the dogs like they might do in a foster situation or in a traditional bricks and mortar rescue. Um, they take care of them as much as they can and they have to look after their basic needs and I'm sure they get to spend time with them, you know, in some ways, but it's not going to be as, um, as useful as in a rescue or in a foster care. Um, <clears throat> the pound, the advantage of course, is they'll instantly take the dog back if that's needed. There's no questions asked. If you can't keep the dog anymore, they'll take them back, but they won't be offering you any support or any advice um, on how to care for your dog particularly. All they can really advise you about is your legalities of looking after the dog. They'll have no rules. Anybody can adopt the dog. As I say, they're desperate to find homes as quickly as they can, so they're not going to spend a lot of time vetting the people that are interested in the dogs. So this comes with some risk to you. Of course, you have the backup support there of taking the dog back. Um, and this is often actually a very cheap option. But there are um, perhaps slightly more risks than if you went to traditional bricks and mortar or a foster care type rescue. So how can you reduce the risk? Um, so depending on your situation, you might consider one of those options. Suits you better and suits your needs better. Um, Dog rescues um, should have a license in Scotland. This means that certain standards have to be met. They have to offer to take dogs back um, and they have to look after the dogs and transport them in certain ways. So if you are using a rescue in Scotland and you're not sure, check if they're licensed. The rescue must offer aftercare and support. This is part of those license conditions. When you're looking at a rescue as well, check their reviews and check their social media. See how they interact with people that have adopted dogs. See how they help people that are asking for help. How do they talk to people? Do they have time to spend with people? Because all of this will give you some kind of indication as to what, um, what kind of support and help you might get. Every rescue is going to be different in the way that they interact with people. So get a feel for them over a period of time if you can um, and find out as much as you can about the rescue. How do you feel about dealing with them? If the worst happened, um, do you think they would support you and help you? Um, whenever you have decided on a particular dog, get as much history as you can. Get to know that dog as much as possible. When you're reducing the risk, spend time with the dog as much as you can. Really get a feel for how they're coping, what kind of environment they're from. Are they excitable? Are they calm? How do they feel about you? Are they anxious or not? All of this will give you indications as to how much training and rehabilitation you'll have to put in later on. If you're not an experienced rescue dog owner, then keep those risks as low as possible. Try and make sure that you get the you're going to get the best possible outcome for you and of course the dog as well. Um, ask plenty of questions. Where did the dog come from? Um, you know, ask them about the dog's age, ask them about the dog's prior training, any health conditions. What did their home look like before? Because if that dog's come from a busy home with kids and dogs and all things running around, then maybe that dog might find your home too quiet or possibly the other way around, or maybe the dog's not coping in that environment and actually what they do need is a really quiet home, or maybe they need something more rural or more city, for, you know. So asking questions about what the dog has been through um, and getting to know them is really important. Check the rescue's rehoming policy and find out more about any kind of rules that they have um, that might rule you out because there's no point in wasting time with a rescue if you live in a flat and you don't have a garden and they have a strict rule on gardens and flats so you may as well move on and start looking for something elsewhere but do remember as we're coming into the next um, part of the course we talk about how do you settle a dog in that those types of environments do have their drawbacks so that's something you'll have to overcome um, there's no reason why dogs can't live in flats but what they go through in those first few days does add a few extra challenges so Keep an eye out for that as we go on through the course. And also really follow your gut. If you're not sure about the rescue, if you've got an, any kind of gut instinct that says, this doesn't feel right, or I don't like this, or something or other, just trust your gut. So many times I've worked with people and they said, oh, at the time I should have realized, I thought something was wrong, I should have walked away. 
if you trust your gut, you might actually end up avoiding something that might just turn out to not be right for you. And also note that none of these options are risk free. Um, when you take on a new dog and they come into your home, no matter how brilliant the home was that the dog has come from, no matter how much you know them, no matter how much that dog is quite happy to come and step into your home, it's a traumatic experience and dogs adapt to their environments. So even if somebody tells you that they've had a dog living with them and they've been really destructive and they're not coping, when they come and live in your house and they have a different routine and they have a different walks and different things to do, they might be a completely different dog. And that can go one way or the other. So there's never a risk-free option, but having a rescue that has loads of support, loads of backup and meeting the dog first means you can really, really reduce those risks for yourself. So before we go into the next section of the course, I want you just to take a little minute just to think about what it is exactly you're looking for from a dog. Um, I want you to think about your home environment. How busy is your home? Are there any extended family, any kids, any pets? Who's going to help you look after this dog as well? All of that will help you decide um, what dog is going to be best for you. Many, many families share the responsibility of a dog with their extended family. So it's important to get their input too. And will their home and your home combined suit this, this dog? There'll be a dog for you, but at keeping that all in mind, means you can make a much better choice when it comes to, to the specific dog that you would like to adopt. Um, also consider your extended family and people that might visit. So when you go and visit a rescue dog, if they tell you that dog's not great with kids, consider are there other members of the family that might visit with kids? Um, what does Christmas look like in your house? Does everybody show up with their dogs and their cats and their guinea pigs and their children and their horses? And is it just a big free for all? How is your dog going to fit into that? If your dog doesn't like other dogs or can't be trusted with children or doesn't like men or whatever it is. Um, so trying to think about what your house looks like at those times. And then again, when you're thinking about going on holiday, he'll look after the dog while you're away. So getting the cooperation from friends and family is fantastic. Um, but this dog has to also fit into their home as well if they're going to look after it for you. So just a wee bit of things to think about. Um, thinking about your lifestyle now and in the future, in the next five years and ten years. Of course, none of us can predict the future. But maybe there are things that you can predict. Maybe, you know, you've got older kids and in the next five years, the chances are they're going to want to move out and create families of their own. Or perhaps you're planning on having a family. Maybe you don't have kids of your own yet and that's on the cards. Um, perhaps um, you'll be downsizing your home. Maybe you'll be finishing university or changing jobs. Perhaps you're full-time now and you feel like you might be retiring in a few years or perhaps the other way around. Um, whatever it is that you feel like your home could look like in the next few years, your dog's gonna have to adapt with that too. So these are lots of things that you can start to think about now and it will mean a much smoother transition and the next few years you'll enjoy your dog um, as much as you would hope to. Um, of course, um, when you're thinking about um, different rescues and things like that, you'll probably just um, uh, choose any dog um, that you like. So when you're in a rescue, Try to meet more than one dog if possible. Um, ask the staff for recommendations and they may give them to you anyway once you've told them a little bit about what your future is like and um, how your home might be looking and whether you're a busy home or not. They may suggest other dogs to you. So try to be open-minded. Um, when you know what your lifestyle is, it'll make it much easier for them to help you. I've also talked about what your extended family might look like and um, and what that might look like in the future, what the future is going to look like for you. I guess be open minded because when you're into the rescue and you're looking at dogs, you may see one that you think, gosh, that dog looks exactly like a dog I've seen in the past or I love this dog or this is the kind of dog I was looking for. Perhaps you wanted a small dog or a large dog. Um, but this dog's going to be with you a really long time. So the way that the dog behaves, their personality is always going to be more important than the size and um, and the way they look. So this dog's hopefully going to be with you for a really long time. But of course, 
as everybody does, you'll probably just choose the dog that you want anyway. So who am I kidding? But if you can try and go through all of these things, you'll, um, you'll hopefully end up with the right dog for you or as close to it as possible anyway. Um, that brings us to the end there of section two. Hopefully that's given you some insight into what it might feel like to rescue a dog and how to go about choosing a dog. Um, and I'll see you in section three. Take care for now. Bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section here, we're gonna start preparing for your new arrival. So you've been through all of the options. You've looked at home from home rescues, traditional rescues, international rescues. You've been through the pros and cons. You've found the rescue that's for you. You've looked at all the dogs and all the options and you've settled on your perfect new body. So let's prepare for his arrival. Um, when we're getting ready, the first most important thing is about keeping things quiet and simple. Um, the first few days are the most stressful days that your dog will go through when they come to live with you. So take advice from the rescue. They'll know the dog hopefully as much as anybody possibly can, whichever route you've chosen, and talk to them about the kind of things that you might need. They might tell you that the dog's quite destructive with fluffy beds, so blankets would be better. They might tell you what kind of food that you're going to need, what kind of food the dog's eating already, what kind of toys they like. Um, they might give you some advice about leads and harnesses, and they'll have experimented with a few different options, I'm sure, with the dog. So in this early stages of getting ready, it's time to go shopping and um, start getting all of the things that you need. This is also a good time before your rescue has arrived to check that your garden is secure or that you have a secure area where you can take your dog. You might look secure, but get on your hands and knees and start looking around all of the little holes and nooks and crannies all around the edges, especially if your dog is gonna be a small dog, you'll be surprised how easily they can fit through even the tiniest of gaps. You can start making a plan as well. Um, you're going to think about your house rules. What does your home look like? What kind of routine are you in? And how is your dog going to fit into that? Um, so you'll be thinking about things like feeding times, bed times, where will the dog sleep? Where will they eat? What kind of food? Um, all of these things um, are things you can be starting to plan and think about now. When you know that your new dog, your new buddy is on his way, you might also want to take a few days off work so that you can be with him while he settles in. Don't go too mad with taking time off work because what they need at the early stages is to try and get into a routine quite quickly. So you don't want to take a lot of time off work to settle your dog in and then find actually they've become really dependent over that time. So the first sort of few days to a week would be the most amount of time I would take off because you wanna get back into that routine as soon as you can. You'll be thinking about where you might create a safe space for your dog. Whenever they arrive in your home, they're going to want somewhere that they can go, where they feel safe, where it's quiet, and it's going to be away from you. As well, don't invite anybody around in the first few days. The first few days are just about you and your dog. It's about keeping the barest minimum interaction. We're keeping this quiet. We're keeping this simple. Um, and also before you start um, and bring your dog home, go to part two of the course so you know exactly what to expect and you're well prepared. Um, in part two, we're going to be talking about those really crucial three days. They're so influential in getting your dog off to a great start and so much can go wrong during these times. So this is the most important part. Um, we'll be talking about how to get them in through those first few days and how to prevent problems that aren't necessary going forward. Um, and I look forward to seeing you then. Take care for now. Bye-bye.